Presented by Caltech. So it's great to see such a wonderful turnout for this uh, lecture, which is quite historic for us here at Caltech, given our legacy in infrared astronomy. And it's my great pleasure to do the introduction of Tom Seufer, who, until I took over as division chair in 2015, was my boss. Um, so I, I just want to start by pointing out that infrared astronomy is the study of the universe at wavelengths of light that we, as humans, experience as heat. But thanks to instruments on ground-based telescopes and to space-based telescopes such as NASA's Spitzer mission, the study of the universe in, in, in the infrared is right now as crucial uh, to our understanding of the contents and structure of the universe, things like galaxies, stars, and planets, how they formed and how they evolved, as the optical light is that our human eyes are sensitive to. And Caltech has played a crucial role in the development of modern infrared astronomies, starting in the 1960s with pioneers such as Bob Layton and Jerry Neugebauer. So uh, Caltech's infrared group, which was established in the 60s, was famously called the Infrared Army. And this army was initially under the command of Gary Neugebauer, and if any of you know Gary, you would actually recognize his command is probably an appropriate word. But through his uh, vision and drive, uh, this group developed novel instruments that they demonstrated on Palomar's Hale telescope and later on the Keck telescopes. And this group was also pivotal, pivotal in developing infrared space telescopes, starting with the infrared astronomy satellite called IRAS, which was launched in 1983, and later the Spitzer Space Telescope, the legacy of which we'll hear about today. Uh, and turning to introduce our speaker, uh, Tom Seufer's connection to Caltech goes way back to when he was an undergraduate, and I said I wouldn't say which class, but it was a while ago. Uh, he got his PhD from Cornell and came back to Caltech as a senior research fellow in 1978 and joined our faculty in 1989. So I guess you could say he started out as a private in the infrared army but worked his way up to being a general. Uh, he played key roles in the development of infrared instrumentation on the ground, on uh, Palomar, and on Keck. He was on the science team of IRAS and a leader in the development of the infrared spectrometer on what became the Spitzer Space Telescope. He was also deputy project scientist for Spitzer, and he became the inaugural, inaugural and only director of the Spitzer Science Center in 1997. Uh, so for all of these things, uh, Tom's legacy as a leader in a field of modern astronomy would be secured. But in addition to that, Tom has also played many pivotal, pivotal roles in leadership here at Caltech, uh, including being chair of the Division of Physics, Math, and Astronomy just prior to myself. I think the day I took over, uh, Tom celebrated <laughs> saying, okay, I was your boss, now you're mine, hooray. <laughs> um, but when he retired, you know, he came to my off and he said, oh, office and he said, okay, I want to retire. And the reason I want to retire is that I, I don't want to feel that I have to come to work every day. But I have to say, he has. Uh, <laughs> besides currently directing the Spitzer Science Center. He serves as chair of the board that oversees the Keck telescopes and is a member of the board that oversees the development of the 30 meter telescope project. And so hardly retired, I think 
uh, Tom is continuing to lead us forward uh, in uh, the modern era of astrophysics at Caltech. So I want you to give a hearty welcome to Tom Seufer, who's going to tell us about the legacy of the Spitzer Space Telescope. Well, thank you, Fiona, and uh, I do appreciate you not mentioning the class that I was graduated in. It was a while ago. Uh, good evening. Um, tomorrow, the Spitzer Space Telescope, NASA's great observatory for infrared, infrared astronomy, which is pictured here, uh, will be put into safe mode, and thus will end its more than 16-year mission of exploring the infrared universe. It's a pleasure for me to talk, talk about what Spitzer has accomplished in these 16 years and how this was achieved. As, as Fiona mentioned, the infrared sky is very different from the sky that we see in visible light, where our, where our eyes are sensitive. What you see here is this, the sky in visible light, if you could find a dark sky location on a clear moonless night. What you see is, is uh, many stars, and you see the Milky Way along the center of this uh, projection. Um, an important part of the image is the dark lanes, which are called the Great Rift of the Milky Way. And these are uh, uh, the result of interstellar dust between us and the background stars in the Milky Way. This dust, which really more like smoke, uh, is extremely effective in ab absorbing and obscuring visible light and hiding the view of what lies behind it. If our eyes were sensitive to near-infrared light, that is to say, in this particular image, which is from the two-mass all-sky survey, which was actually executed by the IPAC Center here at Caltech, this is, these images are uh, at wavelengths about between two and four times the, the wavelength of light that our eyes are sensitive to. <clears throat> what stands out here is the light uh, that the light uh, that we see has is much better able to penetrate the the dust that had blocked the visible light view of the more distant Milky Way. The interstellar dust is much less effective in blocking this near infrared infrared light. The densest dust lanes, which you can sort of you can see here along along the plane of the Milky Way. Uh, still hide the most obscured regions. To see through these dust lanes, we need to go to yet longer wavelengths, wavelengths where Spitzer excels. If our eyes were sensitive in the mid and far infrared, where, where Spitzer is, this is the sky we'd see. The wavelengths here I'm talking about are between 20 and hundreds of times the wavelengths of the light that we can see. This picture from the, from the COBE satellite shows a much different sky than in the visible or even in the near infrared. Dust that was blocking the background light now is radiating brilliantly, and the starlight that we could see previously has virtually entirely disappeared. The blue S that you can see here is the warm interplanetary, interplanetary dust of our solar system in the plane of the planets. This dust is about at room temperature, or 300 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. The bright yellow is um, the glowing interstellar dust from our Milky Way and the nearby interstellar clouds that are heated by forming stars interior to them. This dust is at a temperature of 20 to 50 degrees Kelvin, that is to say 20 to 50 degrees above absolute zero. These three different views of the sky, visible, near-infrared, and the mid and far-infrared, illustrate that the sky looks very different when we look at it at different wavelengths. To properly understand the universe, it's vital that we observe the universe at different wavelengths to see different phenomena. The Spitzer Space Telescope was the, has been NASA's infrared view of the universe. What I've described so far is basically uh, talking about the temperatures of astronomical bodies. And that's illustrated in this picture here. Uh, 
all bodies at temperatures above absolute zero emit electromagnetic radiation at wavelengths that depend on the temperature of the body. Uh, stars are very hot. In this case, we've taken a, a temperature of roughly 10,000 degrees above absolute zero. And they, it, they emit their radiation mostly in the visible and ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. Material that, sur that surrounds a stars are in the temperature range from many hundreds to about 1,000 degrees above zero, absolute, absolute uh, temperature. And they radiate in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum from several tens to about 10 times the wavelength of visible light. This auditorium that we're all sitting in is at room temperature, about 300 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. And it, the, it's bathed in, in mid-infrared radiation 10 to, 15 time, 50, 10 to 50 times the wavelength of visible light. Interstellar matter, which in this case we've sort of illustrated over here in the red, uh, is at temperatures between 20 and 100 degrees above absolute zero and emits in the far infrared 50 to 100, hundreds of times the wavelength of visible light. The sky in the infrared is viewing much colder, colder material than stars. And the brightnesses that we see of particular objects in the infrared at different wavelengths tell us what temperatures we're seeing. Mostly, the far infrared radiation shows interstellar dust, the material that forms planets in, in, in different stellar systems. The concept that all bodies radiate at wavelengths associated with their temperature is certainly essential to why we go to space to do infrared astronomy. Remember, this auditorium is bathed in mid-infrared light. Because of this, doing infrared astronomy from the ground is very much like trying to do optical astronomy in the middle of the day. The brightness of the surroundings means that the sky beyond the atmosphere is, is, uh, is, uh, sig is significantly brighter than the sky that we're trying to see. If you take a telescope that you've built to try and study the mid-infrared from the ground, and you take that telescope and you put it into space, and you make it cold enough so it's not emitting, then that's like basically like the sun going down to do optical astronomy. Literally, the, the gain in sensitivity, which is about a factor of 1,000, is a, just about the same gain in sensitivity as trying to do uh, the gain in sensitivity from doing optical astronomy in the middle of the day to the middle of the night. This is really illustrated here, where the, the brightness of the sky in the daytime, or uh, sorry, from the ground is this, is this curve, the brightness of the sky from, from space it, with a cold telescope is this curve. The, the difference in the brightness is, is a factor of a million. The, the difference in the sensitivity that you get is a factor of 1,000. Another reason that we want to go to space is because the atmosphere uh, in, in the infrared is, is, is not very transparent. This plot here shows the, the atmospheric transmission from a good mountain site uh, with, from the, in the infrared. And mostly, it's opaque. So the way to be able to have a clear view of the universe is to go above the atmosphere to be able to see the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum in the infrared. The final uh, advantage of going to space, which we really didn't appreciate until we got there, was the stability of the environment in space. Uh, this, the, the, the much greater stability of a telescope in space as compared to sitting on a, a, in a, uh, on a telescope on the Earth uh, has enabled us to do, make very precise, very high precision measurements, which are equivalent to uh, al allow us to, to be a major uh, effort in studying exoplanets in the infrared. The key attribute of Spitzer to make it exquisitely sensitive is the telescope must be cold. We've had, we've had two basic ways to, to do this. The, this was what, we, what I would call the 1990 version 
of Spitzer. And this is the version that ultimately was launched in 2003. In both cases, the size of the telescope is the same, the temperature is the same, the lifetime is the same. It's suppo they're both supposed to last five, five years as cryogenic missions. Virtually everything else about the telescope was different. The original in, the, in the original design, everything inside the, the satellite was cold on the ground, and it was launched cold. This, this led to a, a very large cryostat. That's the, the, the uh, container, the thermos bottle, if you will, the contain, that holds the, uh, the coolant, the cooling fluid. Uh, and that led to a, a very massive, complex, and therefore very expensive mission. The new design that was, that was uh, derived basically began right after the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. And if those of you who are old enough remember when it was launched, uh, it had a, a major problem with spherical aberration and large, expensive space astronomy missions immediately went out of favor. For Spitzer to, to be able to survive, uh, a, a major a redesign had to occur to, to reduce the cost of the mission. There were two profoundly important innovations that were, were developed. Uh, first was radiative cooling in the satellite, and the second was the orbit, a solar orbit. And both of these, which I'll talk about a bit later, have led to a, a much less massive, simpler, and less costly satellite to build, to launch, and to operate. This is a, a cutaway drawing of the Spitzer uh, telescope, uh, Spitzer satellite as it was launched. You, the heart of the satellite is the telescope, the instrument chamber, and then the cryostat, which held the superfluid helium to cool the, to the, cool the telescope and the instruments. The telescope is an 85 centimeter diameter telescope, 33 inches in diameter, and cool, it was cooled during the cryogenic mission to as low as five degrees above absolute zero. The instrument chamber, which is below the telescope, held, held three, three uh, uh, instruments during the cry and all operated during the cryogenic mission. The, the chamber was operated at 1.3 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. And the, the tank of helium held about 75 gallons of liquid helium, superfluid helium, and it lasted five, five and three quarters years. The first big innovation that I, I mentioned is radiative cooling. You can't really see it here, but there's the outer shell of the, tel of the telescope structure is black and radiates into space. Uh, and uh, this reduced enormously the, the heat load on the, the liquid helium, allowing the helium to last for this much longer time. On the other side of, of the telescope structure is the solar panel, which not only provided the power to, to power the satellite, but also provided shade to protect, to, so to uh, minimize the heating of the, uh, of the telescope and its structure from the incident sunlight. Below, below the telescope is this, the spacecraft, which housed the the power, the telemetry, the pointing, and the, the uh, uh, computing system that operated the, the, the uh, satellite. This, this uh, picture shows this very large radiating surface that allowed the telescope, uh, reduced the, uh, the heat load inside the, 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 the telescope, and re was able to cool it substantially. Um, on this side of, of this structure, uh, the, this, the uh, shell is shiny. The purpose of that was to reflect nearly all of the heat that radiated at it 
from the back of the solar panels. This large black radiating surface allowed the telescope to be launched warm, and the radiative cooling then cooled it uh, to uh, very low temperatures after it reached space. Again, this, is, this allowed the total mass of the cryogen to be drastically reduced so that the, the satellite was a much simpler and lighter and therefore less expensive satellite that could be built to achieve our scientific objectives. The other major innovation that I mentioned was the, the, the orbit of Spitzer. Before Spitzer, astronomy satellites orbited the Earth. <clears throat> Spitzer orbits the sun. That's illustrated here. Here's, in this, in this picture, the sun is fixed at this position, and the Earth is fixed at this position. And Spitzer basically just drifted away slowly from, from the Earth. It, it started very close to the Earth. It's now uh, at about a distance of about one and a half times the distance from the Earth to the sun. During the cold mission, when when all the instruments were, were uh, operating very close to absolute zero, uh, this lasted, as I said, 5.7 5, 5 years. Um, after we understood that after the, cry, after the cryogen uh, was ended, uh, the radiative cooling would allow the telescope to, to remain cold enough, and two of the, of the channels of one of the uh, of one of the imagers to, to be cold enough that they could continue operating at, at full sensitivity. And we've been operating the, that portion of the Spitzer mission, uh, what we call the, the warm Spitzer mission, since July of 2009. Spitzer was, is a, a small telescope by modern standards. The, as I mentioned, it's an 85 centimeter diameter telescope. It's pictured here. Uh, and it's light enough that one person could, can lift it. That's, to me, that's pretty amazing. But this is, because it's cold and in, it, it's incredibly sensitive, the, uh, this factor of the thousandths gain in sensitivity means that effectively this this telescope has the same sensitivity to detect uh, uh, star, stars or star-like star -like objects as, as would an approximately 30-meter telescope on the ground. Below the telescope is this dome volume where the, where the instruments are housed. The three instruments that that were operated during the, the cold mission were the infrared array camera, which operated um, in, mid in, in the near, infra, near and mid-infrared, obtaining imaging in, at those wavelengths. The infrared spectrograph, which operates, operated from 5 to 40 microns in the mid-infrared, uh, providing mid-infrared spectroscopy. And the multiband imaging photometer, which provide, provided mid and far infrared imaging. Uh, together, together, all of these instruments span nearly two orders of magnitude in wavelength coverage to fully see the infrared universe. Currently, there are only two channels are operating, two of the, the shortest wavelength channels in the infrared array camera that operate at 3.6 and 4.5 microns. That is about seven and nine times the wavelength of the light that we can see. A crucial component as to why we've gained, we have so much uh, uh, sensitivity is that these, uh, the instruments had, have all had state-of-the-art detectors, which the instrument teams that built them had spent decades developing in preparation for the mission. Summarizing the gains that uh, Spitzer achieved, first, there's the huge gain in sensitivity associated with the technology the development that went into building the instruments. This sensitivity allows us to image large swaths of the sky to unprecedented depths, and it enabling us to find new phenomena. The 
uh, the orbit that we, we were able to use, the solar orbit, allowed us to achieve more than 7,000 hours per year of science observation as compared to less than half of that if the, the uh, observatory had been operating in a, in a low Earth orbit, as was the, more, the norm uh, previously. And, and we were able to achieve the long, the long lifetime, 16 years in total, uh, certainly provided us the opportunity of, to observe many different phenomena and to pursue the infrared observations of new, new phenomena as they were discovered during our operation. Finally, the, the, uh, uh, the, the power of, space, of the space environment for high precision observations and the pr tremendous advantage of being able to uh, spend extended periods staring at a given uh, target has enabled us to pursue a, sub a profoundly important program in, in uh, studying exoplanets. We put this all together, the sensitivity, the efficiency, the stability, and the lifetime, Spitzer has really touched virtually all areas of modern astrophysics. And the, the reach of this observatory has been profound. I want to now spend a, the, the, most of the rest of my talk talking about what the scientific legacy is of, uh, of the Spitzer Space Telescope. With more than 8,600 refereed papers published based on Spitzer data, the, our scientific legacy is vast. I'll describe only three areas of Spitzer science that I will be part of most, its most last, long-lasting legacy. Dusty galaxies and galaxy evolution is one of the areas where we knew before launch that Spitzer would make major contributions. The bulk of Spitzer's contribution in this area came during the cryogenic mission. The first billion years of the universe is an area that was just starting to be explored when Spitzer was launched. And we really didn't know what Spitzer could contribute. Work was begun in the cryogenic mission and has continu continued unabated in, in the war mission. And finally, the study of exoplanets is a field that was literally exploding as Spitzer launched. We didn't know that Spitzer could contribute to this area, but uh, we're so uh, pleasantly uh, surprised that uh, we've been able to make major contributions in this area, and I'll be uh, describing some of those. The first area where Spitzer has made major contributions in learning how the universe works is in understanding that most of the star formation in the universe is hidden from view in visible light by the dust that pervades the interstellar medium of nearly all galaxies. Here I've shown a normal spiral galaxy, specifically the uh, nearby spiral galaxy M81 in visible light, in the near-infrared light of Spitzer, and in the mid-infrared light of Spitzer. The visible image shows starlight and, and spiral arms, some of which are seen in silhouette through, through the absorption of the interstellar dust in the galaxy. The near-infrared uh, light from Spitzer cuts through, through the dust and shows how smoothly the light from the stars is distributed throughout the galaxy. Finally, the mid-infrared uh, Spitzer image over, is overlaid on the stellar light, and the mid-infrared image is from the dust heated by the young stars formed within the dust clouds in the galaxy. These, these images show that galaxies, even normal galaxies, look very different in visible light of stars and in the dust that hides the youngest stars. Another nearby galaxy, M82, produces far more luminosity in the mid and far infrared than it does in the visible. And the pictures we see in the visible and in the infrared are very different. This visible light image here shows stars and in silhouette, the dust that's actually hiding where the real action is, the prodigious star formation that's ongoing in the center of this galaxy. 
The infrared image over here uh, shows both the stars in blue and the vast extent of the dust in this galaxy. For us to accurately measure how fast stars are forming in M82, we have to measure all of its luminosity, more than 90% of which emerges in the infrared. We convert that luminosity from newly formed stars that we measure with Spitzer into a rate at which the stars are forming. It is this rate of star formation which is the key to, how, to understanding how fast galaxies are growing. This is an even more extreme example of a galaxy where enormous star formation is hidden from view in the visible light and is revealed clearly uh, when looked at by Spitzer. On, on the left is a visible image from Hubble of this galaxy. Uh, this, is, this is a very strongly interacting galaxy system, so it's, it's basically galaxies in collision. On the right, the same image, uh, we've superposed the infrared image, which is basically shows an enormous amount of luminosity emerging from a region that was basically invisible in the, in the, in the other image. It's galaxies like this where most of the star formation is happening in the universe. A major goal of Spitzer was to find and quantify this hidden star formation. What we've learned from many Spitzer studies that's shown here is that the, the rate at which star form, stars form is rapidly increasing. If we're, the present day is over here, and the rate at which stars are forming, which is the vertical axis in this plot, is increasing rapidly, increases by about a, a, an order of magnitude till we get to a time period about 10 billion years ago that, uh, where, uh, that astronomers called cosmic noon. During this period, the star formation in the universe is, was most intense, and roughly 80% of all the star formation during this period was enshrouded in dust, not seen in visible light, but readily measured with the infrared imaging and spectroscopy of Spitzer. Before I move on and talk about uh, how Spitzer has been studying uh, the first billion years in the universe, I need to remind you of a couple of terms. First, this redshift as it measures distance, and then look back time in the universe. Astronomers measure the distance to galaxies by measuring their redshifts. Because the universe is expanding, galaxies are receding from us, and those more distant are receding faster. This is illustrated here where we have a spectrum of the sun, and the spectral lines are the black lines that are absorption lines in the sun. As if we look at a galaxy that's moving away from us that looks like the spectrum of the sun, which most galaxies do, these same spectral lines have moved to longer wavelengths. They've moved to the redder portion of the spectrum, and astronomers say that these lines are red shifted. There's a quantity which is one plus the redshift, which multiplies the rest wavelength of a line to determine the wavelength of the same line in this galaxy with, that's receding from us with, with a particular velocity. Because the universe is so vast, the distances measured that we measure in this way are enormous. So when we, when we measure their distances, we are usually describing this in how long it takes the light to reach us from the galaxy. If we take a specific example for a galaxy at a redshift of one, the wavelengths that we see are twice the wavelengths that the wavelengths of the, that were emitted in, in that galaxy. In this particular case, the velocity, the apparent velocity of the galaxy is is 60% uh, of the speed of light, and the, it's taken light 7.8 billion years to reach us from that galaxy. That means we're looking back to the galaxy as it was 7.8 billion years ago. For galaxy at a redshift of six, which is sort of this threshold, uh, the light we measure is seven times the wavelength that as it was when it uh, when it was emitted. The apparent velocity of the galaxy is about 96% of the, 
of the speed of light. And it's taken that light 12.7 billion years to reach us. So the look back time to a galaxy at a redshift of six is 12.7 billion years. What's magical about that is the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe as we know it, was we believe is 13.7 billion years. So at a redshift of six, with a look back time of 12.7 billion years, we're seeing a galaxy as it was a billion years after the Big Bang. When we launched Spitzer, we believed that, that, that this, so, this distant universe, the first billion years, was going to be the domain of the next generation of space observatories, J the James Webb Space Telescope. Happily, some young astronomers who weren't, uh, who weren't suffering under this preconception uh, tried and used Spitzer and Hubble to explore this domain, which is as we, as I would like to describe it, approaching cosmic dawn. How do we find galaxies in this at these, in these enormous distances? The most effective technique for finding galaxies at these high redshifts is the dropout technique, which was invented by uh, Caltech's Chuck Steidel. To do, to do this, you, you have to take a pictures of the same patch of sky in many different wavelengths. In this case, we have images of the same patch of sky uh, in Spitzer wavelengths at these two wavelength channels that, that Spitzer is still operating at, 3.6 and 4.5 microns, and many different, several different wavelengths using the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we, see that the gal we see a galaxy uh, in the Spitzer uh, images, and we see that same galaxy in, in the wavelengths imaged in, with, with Hubble, and at some point, the galaxy disappears. It drops out. This wavelength, is, this wavelength where it drops out is identified with a strong ultraviolet absorption of atomic hydrogen in the intervening line of sight. Here, the source disappears below 1.1 microns, here it's seen in 1.1. It's not seen at wavelengths below that. And this corresponds because of the, wave, the strong ultraviolet absorption of atomic hydrogen. This corresponds to a redshift of a pro, close to eight. This object is then modeled as a galaxy with a redshift associated with this dropout wavelength, and then the longer wavelength measurements are used to, to fit uh, a model of a galaxy uh, uh, that has no, these known, known features and uh, to calculate both the age of the stars in the galaxy and the total mass of stars producing the light in that galaxy. This, this approach has been very successful in identifying galaxies seen at, at, uh, uh, at redshifts beyond six uh, using the combination of Spitzer and Hubble data. This, this particular uh, galaxy uh, is modeled, is, is identified as one uh, at a redshift of 7.6, which is a look back time of 13 billion years when the universe was 700 million years old. The dropout technique has, as I said, been very successful in identifying distant galaxies and estimating redshifts for them. At the very faintest steps that can be probed with Spitzer and Hubble, researchers are finding many galaxies at look back times of 13 billion years or more. The objects that are, that are circled in the center of these circles, and mostly they're very, very faint and you can, often you, you can't see them, I can't see them, but the, the, they are the, actually there. Uh, they're all high confidence candidates for galaxies that look back times of more than 13 billion years. This particular image, this is hard work to, to obtain these data. This particular image required a Spitzer observation of more than 100 hours pointed at a single patch of sky with a correspondingly long Hubble observation. Because the redshifts in these systems 
are, uh, are not obtained using what, the, the, what I would call the old-fashioned uh, standard way of, of uh, establishing a redshift by taking, finding an object, taking a, a spectrum, and identifying a spectral feature, uh, it's vital to validate the approach by showing that some of the targets agree from the redshift determined through the obtaining of, redshift, uh, of spectra with those of use, using this dropout technique that I've, that I've just described to you. This, this slide illustrates that this is indeed a, a very good approach to, to estimating redshifts for very distant objects. The, the spectra were obtained for three, these three objects were, were found here. These spectra were obtained with the Keck Observatory, and the redshifts in red are, are the, the spectroscopic redshift determined from Keck observations. The, the number in white is the redshift estimated using this photometric dropout technique. And you can see there the, the estimates are in very good agreement with each other. These objects are sufficiently faint that obtaining detailed information about these galaxies is going to require many hours of spectroscopic observation with the next generation uh, infrared space observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope. A particularly important application for, of this technique is the galaxy which I'm going to show you now, which is a galaxy that was observed 550 million years after the Big Bang. This, again, is, was identified using the dropout technique with finding uh, the target in, in, in the two Spitzer channels, in long wavelength channels in, in Hubble, and then uh, missing here the dropout establishing this is the red sh the redshift the the redshift estimated was roughly nine a very uh, high precision spectroscopic follow up uh, established that the redshift of this object was actually nine point one one with some more digits the redshift that was that is established means that the galaxy is seen. At a, at a look back time of 13.2 billion years, 550 million years after the, after the universe was formed, after the Big Bang. The Spitzer data, which are here, show a, uh, an increase in flux from the shorter wavelength to the longer wavelength. In astro the, ast the astronomers uh, referred, uh, described this using a term, the Balmer, the Balmer break. Which, measures, which is measured from the, the Spitzer data. This allows astronomers to estimate that the age of the stars seen in this galaxy are about 300 million years old. So we have a galaxy seen 550 million years after the Big Bang. And the age of the stars in this galaxy is 300 million years old. That means that the galaxy itself has, should have formed the stars in the galaxy should have formed about 250 million years after, after the Big Bang. Or in, in units of these redshifts that I've been talking about, a redshift of 16. That's an enormous redshift. And this is where this redshift is consistent with the redshifts uh, that uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background tell us that the first stars in the universe had be, were beginning to form. So it certainly appears from this galaxy and others like it that we're, we actually are seeing the first generation of stars uh, in, in the universe. How far can we go with Spitzer? Well, some, uh, some other groups have continued to search for and, and uh, indeed confirm even more distant uh, galaxies. This is a set of, of images from, that are suggested as, as galaxies at redshift of 9 and even approaching 10 that were found using the same dropout technique, where indeed what we have are, are galaxies where they're detected in the light of Spitzer. And the longest wavelength light from, from Hubble, but nothing else in Hubble. The, the, the dropout wavelength is, is the longest possible wavelength uh, seen from, from Hubble. 
These, these systems were suggested to, to be at redshifts approaching 10. And indeed, a, a follow-up observation from, from this, this group has shown spectroscopically uh, a redshift uh, using Hubble, not Spitzer, using Hubble, consistent with the redshift of 11. That is a galaxy that's being seen about 400 million years after the Big Bang. For those of us who, who, who uh, were taught that uh, the distant universe was only observable with the largest possible telescopes, it's rather astonishing to think that a, a, a little 33-inch telescope is making important observations of the most distant galaxies in the universe. Um, it's, uh, this is basically as far as, as astronomers have, have gotten using the combination of Spitzer and Hubble to find the most distant galaxies in the universe. And so that's actually a good thing because it's, it's giving James Webb Space Telescope something useful to do uh, <laughs> in, in this area. Now I want to turn to, to the work that Spitzer has done in studies of planets orbiting other stars. The first detection of a planet orbiting another main sequence star was made in 1995. And as I mentioned, exoplanets were not part of the science definition of Spitzer. Just how far we've come uh, is sort of illustrated. When I was a graduate student, the founders of infrared astronomy were, were uh, making the first uh, observations of the thermal infrared emission from the, from the giant planets in our own solar system, that is to say, from Jupiter and, and Saturn. We're now producing data on exoplanets that's superior to those data. The ability to observe exoplanets with Spitzer is really a tribute to the superb instruments that we have, the outstanding spacecraft, and the enormous advantage of observing from space, where the environment is incredibly stable, and ab observations can be planned for long periods so that one can stare at a given object for a long period of time. I want to spend a minute explaining some of the nomenclature that I'll use. First thing to, re to, to for me to say is that if this is a star with an orbiting planet, all of this is, falls, we're observing all of the light from this system all of the time. The, the star and the planet are so close together that you, we certainly, we cannot spatially resolve them. This is showing how a planet will be orbiting a star. First it goes in front of the star, and then it follows around it, and then it goes, the planet goes behind the star. And I'm going to go back and run this again. So first the planet is going to transit in front of the star. It then follows in, the, in its orbital path, and then it goes behind or is eclipsed by the star. And the, the, the three key uh, things to look at in, in the light curve is here the, the planet is going in front of the star. It's blocking out an amount of, of light from the star that's proportional to the area of that planet. So from this, you could measure the size of the planet by the area of the amount of light that's blocked. The, uh, if you can detect the heat from the planet, you can actually see the increase in the flux and then the decrease as different amounts of the hot face of the planet are, are facing us. When the planet goes behind the star, it, it is eclipsed, the, then you see only the flux from the, from the star, and so the difference between this measurement, the planet plus the star, and this measurement, the star by itself, tells you the brightness of the planet. So the measuring the, the flux from the, the planet using this measurement and the, the size of the planet using this measurement lets you then calculate, measure the temperature of the planet. So those are the parameters that we basically measure. This is the first Spitzer exoplanet result. 
which was done early in the cryogenic mission, and it was done by Caltech's Heather Knudsen and her colleagues. This is a direct detection of thermal radiation from a planet uh, with the glorious name of HD 189733b. This is a hot Jupiter. This measurement was made at uh, 8 microns, and this is a 33-hour continuous observation of the system. First, you see the transit, where the planet blocks light from the star, and then you see the eclipse, where the, the, the planet goes behind the star. You see here this thermal phase curve, where the light uh, is increasing as you see more and more of the hot face of the planet uh, as it's going around in its orbit, and then the transit. Two important things here. First, you see uh, the, 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 this curve shows this, is the, the thermal phase curve, and shows that the peak brightness occurs, uh, the peak brightness of the planet is occurring before the planet is eclipsed. That means that the peak brightness is actually uh, about 30 degrees east of the local noon on that planet. This, requ this requires, the fact that the heat is before the, it, it were, is east of the local noon means that there's substantial heat transport from the day side to the night side of the planet and shows that indeed there is an atmosphere on this planet that, and that atmosphere has to be having very strong winds, thousands of kilometers per hour, carrying heat from, in the direction of the orbital motion of the planet around the, the, the star. Indeed, we've even been able in the same planet to detect uh, through, through the, the spectrum that we uh, obtained uh, using the, spec the, 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 the infrared spectrograph on Spitzer, been able to detain, obtain a spectrum uh, from, eight, from about 5 to 14 microns of the same planet, and which actually shows the detection of, of hot, hot, uh, uh, hot water vapor or steam due in, in the atmosphere of the planet. This is shown due to the strong absorption of, of the water vapor. This is the very first planet outside the solar system where we've been able to detect water vapor in the atmosphere of, of of the planet. Uh, for those of us who, who remember the, the oldie days when these kinds of observations were, were being made for the very first time on the planets of our own solar system, this is really a, a rather ast astonishing uh, um, uh, account. Another example of one of these hot Jupiters with with uh, is that Heather, Heather Newton's group has found a hot Jupiter where the, the temperature peak, which is illustrated here, is, occurs after the, the eclipse. So it's on the other side of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the eclipse, or the, the, the temperature peak is on the other, other side of the eclipse from what we saw before. Nine, Nine of the hot Jupiters had the, this temperature peak that I showed you uh, occur before the, the, tre the eclipse. This one has the temperature peak after, which means that the temperature is west of local noon rather than east of local noon, uh, opposite to that of the other, those other hot Jupiters. It's like if, if, this was, if this was the Earth, it would mean that the hottest time of day was before noon rather than afternoon on that planet. And why this is, we certainly don't understand. Spitzer's been able to detect the effect of an atmosphere on, on planets much smaller than hot Jupiters. This, this uh, particular uh, planet here is a planet, it's about twice the, the size of the Earth, 55 Cancri E. And the plot here shows the same phase curve and shows a, a, an eclipse that is indeed follows the, the, uh, uh, the temperature peak 
uh, meaning that the hottest spot is about 40 degrees after local noon. This again requires that there's substantial heat transport from the day side to the night side, arguing that there has to be a, an atmosphere. In contrast to this, we've actually been able to find a planet that, with no evidence of an atmosphere. Here's uh, another newly discovered uh, uh, planet with a radius only 30% larger than the, than the size of the Earth, uh, LHS 3844b. Here, the eclipse occurs basically at local noon. So, the, so there's no evidence of any, uh, any heat transport and it's consistent with no atmosphere in this, in this planet. The, this, in this particular case, the, the temperature of, of this planet is, is consistent with a very dark surface on the planet uh, uh, of no more than 20% of the light incident on it from its, from its star is, uh, uh, reflect, is, is reflected. By comparison, for our own, for our moon, 12% uh, of the light incident from the sun is is reflected. What was to me the most exciting Spitzer discovery, my particular favorite, even though I like galaxies more than planets, was the discovery of the seven-planet system orbiting the star uh, Trappist One. It certainly re received the most popular attention of, of any work from Spitzer. It was, it was our only, our first and only uh, picture above the fold on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and it was our only Google, Google Doodle. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, this is the only astronomical discovery that's generated a Google, Google Doodle, something that all observatories should aspire to. Before the 20-day Spitzer observation, the, snip, the snippets of data that were uh, finding transits in this system led to confusion and muddled understanding of what was going on. We had a 20-day continuous Spitzer observation that immediately clarified what we were seeing. This is what's shown here. The, this is 20 days of continuous days of Spitzer's looking at this this, uh, uh, this system, and the, the, the letters that you see are transits that are labeled with the associated moon. The astonishing thing was that there were 34 separate transits from which the observing team identified transits of seven distinct planets. All have very strong transit signals that were very easy to detect. From the depths of the transits, the size, the size of the planets were directly determined. All had radii between 0.8 and 1.15 times the, the radius of the Earth. The times of the transits, of the individual transits of each uh, planet varied from the sim uh, and varied around from the simplest models of, of a seven planet system. And these variations are due to the gravitational interactions among the planets. And this permitted the, the masses of the planets to be determined. As of now, uh, we, Spitzer has observed this system for more than 1,000 hours. And uh, the parameters of this, of this planetary system are the most precisely determined uh, so planetary system outside of our own solar system. The TRAPPIST-1 uh, system is much smaller than our solar system. One can see it here. If this is, this is the inner solar system of, of ours, the entire uh, TRAPPIST-1 system would fit very snugly in, well inside the orbit of Mercury. Because the star is a very low luminosity star, less than a tenth of a percent of the luminosity of the sun, uh, all of the planets uh, are much cooler than they would be if they were placed at that distance from the sun. The Spitzer observations determined both the sizes and the masses of the planets. And these parameters uh, can be immediately turned into mean densities of, of these planets. And we've shown these 
uh, in comparison to the mean densities of, of the, rock, of the uh, rocky planets our own, in our own solar system. And they've been plotted in com uh, relative to the illumination from the, hot s from, the, from the host star in units of the illumination of the Earth uh, from our sun. This is sort of a surrogate for the temperature of the, uh, of the planets. The planets that are shown here in the green zone, the Earth in ours, and then planets D and E in the Trappist system, are in what we call the habitable zone, the region where water, if it exists on those planets, would be liquid. Remember, we believe that liquid water is essential for life. So habitable zones are where astronomers uh, are going to start searching for life-bearing planets. So in this, in this Trappist system, there are at least two planets that, uh, that are in the habitable zone. From all the Trappist data, animators have begun to imagine what, it, what planetary system might look like. I certainly hope, I, I would dare say I expect, but I certainly hope that within a decade, these kinds of uh, images will, will have more than imagination going into them. Okay, let me close by talking a little bit about the impact of Spitzer. Um, these are the raw numbers. We've observed for 115,000 hours, more than 115,000 hours. By comparison to a ground-based observatory, this corresponds to more than 50 years of observations. And indeed, compared to a, 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 a space observatory in low Earth orbit, it's, it's actually approaching 40 years of observations. Uh, to date, we've produced more than 8,600 uh, refereed scientific papers. Uh, currently, half of the scientific papers that is, are coming out of Spitzer are based on research with, done with the Spitzer Data Archive. Um, this, uh, this, this research with the archive will certainly, well, I expect it to continue for a long time. And so I, we certainly can expect the productivity from the Spitzer Space uh, Telescope to, to continue for several decades at the very least. Um, you know, uh, observatory directors are always trying to find a statistic in which their observatory is the most impactful. <laughs> and uh, that's just the nature of directors. Um, and so this is, this is a particular metric which is, has become very fashionable. It's called the H index. And it, what it does is it measures how much other researchers cite the work from a given research, researcher or from a given observatory. And this is a plot that was put together in, in 2016 by Jenny Novescu of the Space Telescope Science Institute. So it was not, not our people. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, you probably can't read the labels down below, but not surprisingly, in this, in this metric, Hubble came out f top rank. And by the way, the Keck Observatory came out second. And Spitzer uh, was uh, ranked fourth in this particular metric. But this, uh, this metric doesn't account for how long an observatory has been operating, an older observatory having had many more years of of published results should have a, long, a, 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 a bigger impact. So uh, Jenny actually produced a different metric. <laughs> this, is, this is that same metric, the, the, the H index, but divided by the age of the observatory. So you're sort of normalizing out the age of the observatory. In this metric, uh, Hubble has moved down in the rankings. <laughs> Keck has moved with it. Uh, and Spitzer has, is at the top. And so it's obvious to me that this is the right metric <laughs> to measure the impact of an observatory. So what's, what's happening, what's going to happen uh, after tomorrow? Well, the James Webb Space Telescope, which we're all looking forward to, is going to launch in, uh, hopefully in May of 2021. And it's going to going to study in detail the universe that Spitzer, Hubble, and the uh, great ground-based observatories have, have been exploring for the very first time. 
And let me close by showing you what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, after the, our last observation, the Spitzer is going to point its antenna at the Earth and transmit the data to the Earth. And then a command is going to be issued to command Spitzer to go into, space, into safe mode, at which point the solar array will be pointed perpendicular to the sun. And then Spitzer will continue rotating and orbiting the sun uh, as long as the solar system exists. And so that will be the end of Spitzer tomorrow. And finally, um, I, I need to thank all of the dedicated members of the Spitzer team here at the Spitzer Science Center at Caltech, at JPL, at Lockheed Martin, Ball Aerospace, Cornell University, the University of Arizona, the Center for Astrophysics, the Goddard Space Flight Center, the Ames Research Center, and all the other partners that have made Spitzer Space Telescope the very best space observatory ever. Thank you. <laughs>